Good morning. Um, this video is about the early republic, and it's really what happens after the uh, start of the country and after the Constitution has been signed. And we have a new government that's going to take place, and this first part is called the Federalist Era. This is where the first president is going to be elected, and the first president, George Washington. George Washington, he is going to be unanimously selected. His vice president is going to be John Adams. And as the very first president, he is going to be very cautious about what he's doing. Uh, he knows that he's setting precedent for everything. So he just settles on the term Mr. President. He's not going to be your highness or your honor or anything like that. He's not going to be bowed to. He just shakes hands. And He's going to appoint some secretaries. The first secretary he appoints is Alexander Hamilton, who's the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, Hamilton, he pushes for this national dominance in economic matters. He wants the federal government to be in control of the money. And one of the big things he's going to do is start something called the First National Bank. And this causes problems because in the Constitution, there's nowhere that the government has permission to start a bank Alexander Hamilton is going to get away with this because he's going to use the necessary and proper clause of Article 1. Henry Knox is going to be the first Secretary of War. Today that's the Secretary of Defense, but it's really the same thing. And Henry Knox is the person that Fort Knox is named after. Then we have Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he's going to be the first Secretary of State. That means he's going to be the first uh, national diplomat, basically. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had previously served as a, an ambassador to uh, France, so he's got experience in the international scene. Then we have Edmund Randolph, who's the Attorney General. He's going to be the top legal official in the government at the time. And then Samuel Osgood, believe it or not, may be the most important of these. He was the Postmaster General. The only way news got around in 1780, 89 is through the mail. So Samuel Osgood had to make sure that the mail was delivered. Then we have the legislature. The very first order of business for the legislature is to create a Bill of Rights. That's the only way that New York and Virginia would sign the Constitution. So there are 12 amendments that are suggested and passed. Ten of those twelve are going to be ratified, which become the Bill of Rights that we have today. So that's the right to bear arms, the right to uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, the free press, um, Ill no illegal search and seizure, etc., etc. Uh, there was an Eleventh Amendment that was going to be passed eventually. It's not going to be passed until 1992, though, and because there were other amendments that happened between when it was first proposed and when it was ratified. We know it today is the 27th Amendment, and the 27th Amendment gives Congress the ability to give itself pay raises. So that's what the legislature is going to do. The judiciary is going to be created with the Judiciary Act of 1789. That's what puts Article 3 of the Constitution into play, and that is going to create the Supreme Court Today it's got eight justices and one supreme justice for a total of nine. But when it was originally created, there were five associate justices, one chief justice for a total of six. Uh, there are going to be three courts of appeal under that. And then finally, there are 13 judicial districts in 11 different states. Uh, Rhode Island and North Carolina, they were not states yet, so there were 13 districts for 11 states. I think it's probably because they wanted 13 for when the other two finally joined. The first Chief Justice is going to be John Jay, who was one of the writers of the, uh, the Federalist Papers. And then there's some drama during Washington's presidency. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, like I said, he wants to create the first national bank. It's over the objection of many in government. Uh, James Madison specifically is going to be against it. Uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton had very different views on how the government was supposed to work. But Hamilton wins, and the First National Bank 
It's going to collect all the war debts from the different states. It's going to establish a currency, and it's going to raise money. To raise money to pay off these war debts, Alexander Hamilton is also going to start a tax on liquor. Now, an excise tax is a use tax. Uh, you find that today on alcohol, tobacco, things like that. People in Pennsylvania were so upset over Alexander Hamilton and trying to tax liquor that they started a rebellion. George Washington, at the head of the army, goes to Pennsylvania, and when the Pennsylvania liquor distillers find out that it's Washington on the other side of the field, uh, they basically surrender. And Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, the government, and these liquor makers are going to work out a deal. There's still going to be a tax, but it's going to be a lower tax, and everybody ends up fairly happy. There are going to be two different factions that develop. These are not political parties. Political parties do develop eventually, but they start out just as two different factions. We have the Federalist faction and the Republican faction. Uh, once again, not political parties. These Republicans are not related to the Republicans we have today. Uh, Federalists were mostly in New England. You could find them in other parts, but mostly New England. Uh, they thought that the young nation had a host of enemies, uh, internal enemies and external enemies. And because of these enemies, they wanted a stability. They wanted a strong legal system. They wanted everything to be in order. And they put little faith in the masses. They didn't trust the people. Republicans are mostly from the Middle Atlantic and the southern states, rural areas as well. Uh, they just they thought the U.S. had a bright future, and they didn't think there were a lot of enemies. And they wanted political participation to be spread out to more men. Um, the second president, John Adams. John Adams is going to win the first presidential campaign that is contested. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams are going to go against each other. Adams is going to win, but Jefferson becomes the vice president. The system was differently, was done different then. Whoever got the most electoral college votes became president. Whoever got the second most electoral college votes became vice president. That would probably never work today. So what happens while Adams is president? There's a war with France, except it's not a declared war. France is in the middle of a revolution. Napoleon comes to power. And things aren't going very well in France or in England or in Europe in general. Some American diplomats go to France, and three French diplomats are going to meet the American party. These three French diplomats are going to ask for a bribe, and then they're going to have the French government ask for a loan. When the U.S. population, the public, finds out about this bribe attempt, they're angry. And we do almost go to war. I mean, the French agents are going to demand $250,000, which is several million dollars today. So 1798 to 1800, there's an undeclared war with France. There's fighting out on the ocean. There are a couple of land attacks. Uh, during this undeclared war, Adams is going to ask Congress to build a navy. He's going to approve the first peacetime army. Even George Washington is willing to come out of retirement and lead the army again. Uh, in the end, though, John Adams is going to have peace talks with France. And that's despite everybody, including his own party, wanting war to be declared. And... By 1800, Napoleon is in charge, and Napoleon is willing to make a deal, and things calm down. Uh, even though things calm down, John Adams is going to do some other questionable things. He's going to pass the Alien Act, which made it, um, it created a change in how you could become a U.S. citizen. As originally envisioned, you, know, you just had to live in the United States for five years to become a citizen, but he's going to extend it to 14. And it also gave him the power to deport any alien he considered dangerous. And by alien, I mean somebody from another country. There are also going to be the Sedition Act that's targeted towards the Republican faction specifically. Uh, that's the harshest law that the U.S. government has ever passed on free speech. 
and it made it a crime to write or say anything insulting about the government or about the president or about Congress. The idea behind that was to stop the Republican faction from growing bigger and bigger and bigger by shutting them down and making it illegal for the Republican faction to speak against what John Adams was doing. In the end, um, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson are going to write some publications against John Adams. These are known collectively as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Uh, in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, Madison and Jefferson are going to say that citizens can speak against the government. They do that through their states, and the states have the right to decide if the federal government is, is operating in a constitutional way or not. And this idea that the states are going to protect the needs of the people is actually going to lead to this idea of nullification that comes up in about 30, 40 years that eventually leads to the Civil War. After that, we get the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. In the year 1800, John Adams runs for re-election against Thomas Jefferson. The system changes a little bit. Now, instead of the first place person automatically getting president and the second place person automatically getting vice president, they decide we'll have running mates. So John Adams is going to pick somebody to run with him named Charles Pickney. Thomas Jefferson chooses somebody named Aaron Burr. And the way it's supposed to work is Adams and Pickney, their people are going to vote for them, but Pickney will be left off of one ballot. That way Adams has one more vote than Pickney. Adams becomes president. Pickney becomes vice president. Same thing on the other side. Jefferson and Burr will both be on their people's ballots. Jefferson is supposed to get one more vote than Burr. Well, Adams gets 65 electoral college votes. Pickney gets 64. Their side did the right thing. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, they tie at 73, which means one of those two guys is going to be president and somebody didn't leave Burr off like they were supposed to. Um, after the electoral college vote ties, the House of Representatives is supposed to make the decision by voting. And it takes 36 tiebreaker votes before Jefferson finally gets declared the winner. When this is over and Jefferson becomes president, he's going to ask for unity. He's going to ask everybody to get along. He's going to ask for factions to end. Uh, he's also going to decide that it's too expensive for the courts to run 24-7, 365 days a year. And he's also going to say it's too expensive for a judge to be appointed for life. So the Judiciary Act of 1801 is going to be repealed, although it will be replaced in some fashion later. Uh, the other big thing that Thomas Jefferson does is he repeals the Alien Sedition Acts, which is why they're not in effect anymore. All right, the biggest things to know about Jefferson's presidency, and you've already read about Marbury versus Madison by this point. Uh, William Marbury, he is going to be granted a judgeship on the last day of John Adams' presidency, but the letter's not delivered till after midnight. So Jefferson orders his secretary, or I'm sorry, his attorney general, James Madison, to say, William Marbury, not a judge. William Marbury takes it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules two different ways. Number one, Marbury had the right to be a judge but the Supreme Court did not have the power to give it to him. And that sets up the idea of judicial review and the Supreme Court being allowed to decide if something is constitutional or not. After that, Jefferson is going to do the Louisiana Purchase. By 1802, 1803, France is at war with basically all of Europe and Napoleon's running out of money. On top of that, Napoleon's idea of recreating a fresh a French empire in North America, it's dead, it's not gonna happen. So Jefferson makes a deal with Napoleon to buy 830,000 square miles of land in North America for about $15 million. Congress is gonna say Jefferson didn't have the power to do that, but Jefferson says, how are you gonna stop me? I've already done it. Once it's purchased, Thomas Jefferson is gonna send two explorers Lewis and Clark to go and report on what they just bought. So Lewis and Clark are going to make a cross-continent expedition. 
they're going to document and, and make illustration, illustrations of everything they see and then come back and report on it. Thomas Jefferson also sends a guy named Zebulon Pike to explore the southern part of the Louisiana Purchase. And so Zebulon Pike is going to go to Colorado and he's going to go to Wyoming, New Mexico, and parts of, I believe, Oklahoma as well. By 1807, Thomas Jefferson, he says, you know what, I'm done being president. He does not run for a third term, but his hand-picked successor, James Madison, is going to win. What happens during James Madison's presidency? The big thing is the War of 1812. A lot of people look at this as the second American War of Independence. Kind of is, but kind of isn't. Um, the real causes of this war, Napoleon... We're trying to do business with France and England and everybody who will give us money. And England is going to pass laws saying that you cannot, tr you cannot uh, do business with Napoleon. And even though you know we're not subject to those laws, the British Navy is going to start stopping American ships. And suddenly we can't do business with France or England. And then the United States is going to decide, you know what, if we can't do business with whoever we want, we're going to do business with nobody. So we do the Embargo Act and the Non-Intercourse Act. You have the Chesapeake Affair. The U U.S. ship, the USS Chesapeake, is going to be stopped by the British Navy. And when the British Navy fires on this American vessel, they almost sink it. And that's kind of not a good thing. And then last but not least, there's the impressment of American sailors. The British Navy was stopping American ships and stealing sailors off the ships and claiming that they were British runaways. When you put all these three things together, there are people in government who were demanding war with Britain. And James Madison says, sure, why not? So the U.S. declares war in June of 1812. We're completely unprepared. There's no army, really. It's just trained militia. Uh, most of the equipment is left over from the American Revolution, and most of the soldiers are old by that time. Um, there's not much land fighting, except the British do land in Maryland. They marched to Washington, D.C., and they managed to burn the freshly completed White House. Um, fighting is on the ocean and on the Great Lakes. And there are, I believe, like two or three islands that are taken over by the Americans in the, um, the Caribbean. When it comes down to it, though, the war's a draw. Nobody really wins. It, uh, but there is a definite loser. The definite loser are going, is going to be the Native American populations that are east of the Mississippi River. The Shawnee leader, Tecumseh, and um, profit, they're going to side with the British and the Americans defeat those two warriors. Uh, in the south, the Creeks are going to align themselves with the British and they're going to be defeated as well. And both of those groups being defeated are going to eventually lead to the removal of Native Americans from the uh, eastern part of the United States. Another big thing that happens is in the middle of the War of 1812, some people thought that the United States was going to lose. And in 1814, a group of people, lead, they meet in Hartford, Connecticut. And they say, uh, we need, need to either secede from the Union or rewrite the Constitution because we're going to lose. Well, by 1814, a treaty has been signed. And this Hartford Convention is discovered. And the people attending, they look like traitors. Now, most of the people at the Hartford Convention were members of the Federalist faction, by now the Federalist Party. And when it turns out that the Federalist Party is possibly committing treason against the government, uh, people start to leave the Federalist Party, and the Federalist Party is going to die a slow death. After the War of 1812, we have something called the First American System. Uh, this is basically the government's attempt to rebuild America after um, the draw that was the War of 1812. John C. Calhoun, who is from South Carolina, Henry Clay, who is from Kentucky, and James Madison, who is from Virginia, are going to come up with this idea. They're going to create the second national bank. 
they're going to raise taxes on imported goods, and they're going to support American industry. And so this idea of the first American system, that's going to get us into the 1820s. There's also another Supreme Court case that's important. It's McCullough versus Maryland. Um, when the second national bank is chartered and begun, Maryland didn't agree with it. So Maryland passes a law that only banks that are headquartered in Maryland could open up branches in Maryland. Well, that goes to court, and the courts decide that federal law trumps state law. We get most of Florida from Spain, not all of it, but we get most of it. And then after Madison is no longer president, his follow-up uh, follow is James Monroe. James Monroe is going to pass the Monroe Doctrine that says that the Western Hemisphere is closed to European colonization. Basically, you stay on your side of the world, we'll stay on ours. And for the most part, that is going to stay true all the way from the 1820s until World War I in 1914. Last but not least, uh, we get this expansion of slavery. Missouri is going to be allowed into the, into the United States by the American government as a slave state. But to make those anti-slave forces happy, the Missouri Compromise is going to say no slavery can go north of Missouri from then on. Uh, that's not going to stick, though. And then you have the Panic of 1819. It's an economic crash. The War of 1812 ends, and there's going to be the first real depression that the United States experiences, and it lasts for four years up until 1823. Okay, that will get you through um, the stuff you need to know for this part of the, the class, and it will get you through everything you need to know for this part of the test. All right, um, there's the annotated bibliography, and I gave everybody a little bit of a, um, an extension on this. And here's the annotated bibliography instructions of sorts. Uh, what I really need you to do, and this is probably going to be more simple than this looks, I want you to first do a bibliography entry, just like this. So you should have four to five sources from your source evaluation. Very first thing I need you to do is make a bibliography entry that looks like this Chicago style. Remember you do have the Chicago style quick guide that's available in Blackboard. You also have the Purdue OWL that will help you do it. So this is part one of your annotated bibliography. Make a bibliographical entry like this. The second thing I need you to do is give me one paragraph that summarizes each of your sources. So source one, I need one paragraph that summarizes it. Source two, one paragraph that summarizes it, etc., etc. The second, well, so the third thing I need from you is a second paragraph that tells me how you're going to use your source in writing your paper. So the three parts, just to put them all out there, of the annotated bibliography. Number one, a bibliographical entry just like this right here. Number two, a paragraph that it tells me what your source is about. And number three, a paragraph that tells me how you will use your source in writing your paper. That's all it is. So I'm simplifying it just as much as I can for you because I know the instructions look a little bit confusing. So one last time, three parts to your annotated bibliography. For each of your sources, create a bibliography entry. Write one paragraph about your source. What is it about? Give me a summary. And then one paragraph telling me how you're going to use your article in the writing of your paper. Any questions about that, send me an email. And the due date for that is going to be the same as the, the um, midterm exam, which is October 17th, I believe. All right, 25 minutes. I think that's plenty long enough. So we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.